John records Jesus saying in John chapter 4 and verse number 24 that God is a spirit. Literally in the Greek it means God is spirit. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Notice the word must. If you want to be pleasing God in your worship, then this is imperative. It must be done this way, in spirit and in truth. That is, our minds must be set upon the one we worship. We have gathered here today by the authority of Christ as his children In other words, we're convened for religious purposes to worship God in spirit and in truth in this Christian dispensation. In truth means as the truth leads us and guides us and directs us. Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. For our worship to be acceptable then we must operate according to the teaching of the New Testament of Christ. And we must have, in engaging in that worship, our minds upon the one we worship. The word worship, most of the time in the New Testament, is translated from the Greek word proskuneo, which means to kiss the hand forward as an act of homage. It involves an act. One cannot just sit in the worship and silently, without acts, worship God acceptably under normal circumstances. Of course, we don't have in mind the person who literally cannot speak, is without voice. God doesn't expect a person like that to speak. But common sense to us understands that if you can, you must. He doesn't even talk about how well you can do certain things when compared to how well somebody else might do it, but you are doing what the Lord authorized you to do in discharging your obligations to God in our subject this morning in the area of worship. We should, because we are Christians, we are of Christ, we are members of His spiritual body, the church, We should, above all people, have in mind what has been done for us by our God that we didn't deserve, we could not merit, but through faithful obedience to his will, he has given us. So there ought to be an assembly convened for religious purposes, in this case to worship God, with hearts overflowing with thanksgiving and love. And as we live each day of our lives under the authority of our Savior Christ, We ought to, in this assembly and others like it, be serious-minded, know who we're coming before, the God of all the earth, and know why we're here. We're here to worship God, to offer acts of obeisance to Him, which acts are authorized by Jesus Christ, His Son. It comes down to this, God knows how He wants to be worshipped. He knows how best for us to worship Him. And He's revealed in His Word how He wants that done. And if we operate by faith, since faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, then we will engage in what we're authorized to do. Understanding the seriousness of it and the sobriety of it. Now, having said all of that, imagine people who call themselves Christians saying, is it really necessary for me to be there? doesn't really go together, does it? A person who's a Christian wants to be with other Christians, the redeemed of the ages, to be able, as God requires of them on the first day of every week, to worship God in spirit and in truth. Now, I want to zero in this morning on one particular act of worship. We've studied in times past, but it's been quite a while since we specified this topic. I remember back when I was a boy, I don't know whether I was in high school or not, but there was a young fellow close to us that daddy, I don't remember 
a whole lot about it, but I think Daddy invited him, and I did too, to worship. And it was on Wednesday evening in midweek Bible study. And he came into the building, and the first thing he asked was, when he looked out over the building, is, where's the piano? He could have asked, where's the organ? He could have asked, where's the place for the band or whatever else? And nowadays, if you go into one of them, it's almost like a Broadway production as far as a place for even a symphony orchestra. And most people think when they come to the churches of Christ, that's just what you traditionally do, not because the Bible says one way or the other, but that's just what you choose to do, and you start it out that way, and you're comfortable with it, and so you just keep doing it because that's what governs most people in denominational circles. That's the way we like it. Because they've been taught to choose the church of your choice, one that fits you. Well, it shows a wrong concept of the Lord's church in the first place. But the person who becomes a Christian, as Christian is defined in the use of the New Testament, knows they're here to serve God, whatever he requires of them. So they're not trying to figure out what they can do to suit themselves they're earnestly from the heart striving to do what pleases God, whatever he requires of them. That's what it means to be converted when you obey the gospel. That's what was involved even after you believed in Christ and you repented of sins, past sins, alien sins, resolving your heart from here on out as a Christian. You will do as the Lord authorizes you to do. The point we're making here is that when it comes to mechanical instruments of music or any other kind of music that is not singing, it is not acceptable to God. It is a matter of authority because Christianity is the religion of Bible authority. If we're just going to be what we want to be, do as we please, have a good thought in our heart toward God, go through some sort of an emotional experience that makes us feel good. Well, what difference does it make what day we meet? What difference does it make whether we do meet? And on and on you can do because you do as you please it to suit yourself. There was an elderly lady one place where a priest, if you ask her, how are you doing? She says, to suit myself. Well, I don't know where she really meant that, but a lot of people live that way. And they usually make everybody else miserable about them because they're trying to make you do everything to suit themselves. <laughs> that is, as they see fit. But our business is to suit the Lord, to please Him. And all we have to do is learn His will and take Him at His word and act accordingly. And thus we walk by faith and not by sight because faith comes by hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Well, how am I going to know? No. No what the early church did in the worship of God in music. The same way I know anything else about what God wants me to do through Christ Jesus in this Christian dispensation. Remember, Christ said, All authority or power hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 20 and 18. That means that we're not under Moses. That means we're not under whatever governed the patriarchs before the Mosaic age. That means that we're not under any human counsel or anything like that. We're only under the authority of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. Jesus himself said to his apostles, if you love me, American Sanders says, ye will keep my commandments. That's very important to understand. And so we approach this study in that same way, that the New Testament will give us the mind of Christ on the matter. Since he, Paul said to Timothy that Christ is the only mediator, the only go-between between God and man. He's the one who has all authority. He knows what's best for you and for me, whether I understand all about it or not. That's the kind of trust we place in God through Christ and in his gospel system. Thus, when we gather together, convened for the purposes the New Testament says we are convened here to worship Him, then we're mindful of what He said. Now, you read your New Testament through, since we're under the authority of Christ, 
you don't know anything about what he authorizes us to do if you don't know the New Testament. You just can't. It's the Lord's last will and testament. It's where he manifests his will. If I want to know his will about anything, I must know his New Testament. And I must rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, as I study it. Well, if you go through, it doesn't take too long to see all of the verses that deal with music in the New Testament church. Let me just note a few. Or note all of them. In fact, Matthew 26 and verse number 30. You see that those disciples in Christ sung an hymn. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 25, they sang praises. In Romans chapter 15 and verse 9, sing unto thy name. In 1 Corinthians 14, in verse 15, sing with the Spirit. In Ephesians 5, in verse 19, singing psalms. Colossians 3, 16, singing with grace. Hebrews 13, in verse 15, the fruit of the lips giving thanks. Then the last one, James chapter 5 and verse 13, is any Mary, let him sing. Now I said a moment ago, Christianity is the religion of New Testament authority. That means that we're interested in what the Lord authorizes. We know we don't know that unless we know the perfect law of liberty, James 125, which God expects us to walk in. And thus, we quote most often, that's one reason this was in the remodeling the building, put up above this pulpit. Whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do all by the authority of the Lord. All, nothing left out, do all by the authority of the Lord. Thus, we know faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. But it's not the whole Bible, it's under the authority of Christ that we're interested in now because we're in the New Testament church. We're not in Israel of old. Under Moses and the law, we're in the New Testament church. The one that Jesus promised to build, Matthew 16, 18. The one that he did build, Acts 2, and all those who are saved in belief and obedience to the gospel and being baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 37, 38, he adds to the church, Acts 2, 41 and 47. Thus, we're mindful of that, and as I said in the beginning, we must have Bible authority for everything we believe and practice. And when it comes to our singing, that's the reason we sing, because we're authorized to sing. Now, several of us over the years have been in uh, high school bands and other ways. So we're not opposed to mechanical instruments of music, except when it comes to worship God. Well, does that mean we just like to have it our way I've already touched on that no we are a people of the book that is we're all the people of the authority of Christ he's the head of the church it's his will to be done not yours or mine or anybody else's thus when we read through the whole New Testament when it comes to the music God's authorized we see the word sing some people will come up and say because they don't recognize singing as music and say you all don't use music in your worship well, that's not true Singing is music. It's called a cappella. It means without mechanical instrument. It certainly rules out whistling also because that's not singing. It rules out tapping your feet, and beating a bass drum and a tambourine, humming, because humming can't direct anybody. It's just a sound. The singing done by the Lord, when you look at Ephesians 5, 19, and Colossians 3, 16, is instructive. You'll notice also, we don't have solos in the worship assembly where one person stands up and sings somebody else. Why is that the case? Not any authority for it. We speak to one another. We speak to one another as we worship God in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Those are the three classifications of songs in which God has authorized for us to use in the worship of Him in music. We sing psalms, hymns, and Spiritual songs. 
We're interested in authorization. Somebody says, you're awful picky. Folks, I'm very picky when it comes to going to heaven. I'm amazed somebody else is not. When Jesus said, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him, the words that I have spoken unto you, these same shall judge him in the last day. You know what that says to me, put in our common vernacular? Be very picky, David, about what you believe in practice. Make very sure you're operating according to the teachings of Jesus Christ. And how much is said throughout the whole New Testament, in fact, the whole Bible for that matter, on being careful and being sure you're operating according to the teaching of God. Because as Hosea said, when you're ignorant of the Bible, you're destroyed. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. How much is said in the New Testament about studying, about being studious, about hungering and thirsting after righteousness, about spending time in the study of the Bible, about being honest with yourself and with the truth you study, learning how to study it, learning how the New Testament authorizes us to conduct ourselves, how to ascertain the authority of our Lord from the New Testament. It's serious business. I can think of a great many secular pursuits that demand a great deal from the people who would be qualified to pursue them. When you think of medical doctors, you think of people highly trained. When you think of people in so many areas, you think of people highly trained. They know little bits. They know a lot. They know everything. They know the semistic, the systematic connection of old things. They put them together. Nobody tells a doctor, oh, you know the general anatomy of the body. You don't need to know anything else. And then they want you to do uh, some sort of surgery that involves minute dissection of a muscle that has nerves all around it. He said, well, I never got that interested in that. I just didn't see that particular, to be that particular. It seemed to be rather nitpicky to me. No, you wouldn't feel that way. But we're talking about the word of the living God. This quick and powerful, alive and active, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing and sunder of the soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the faults and intents of the heart. That sounds like if I really study the Bible and understand it, it's picking me to pieces, so to speak. Usually we use that to mean you're being too stringent. But no, let the word of God pick me to pieces and show me where I need to alter my thinking and my speaking and my actions that I can bring, as Paul said, every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ. Is that challenge enough for you? To bring every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ. How do I do that and not bring every thought into subjection to what he's authorized me to do? And when it comes to worship, how careful should I be in worship? Parents, how careful should you be in teaching your children how to conduct themselves in worship? Who they're coming before when they're in this auditorium. And does, what does it say to you in training them to sing? Set up and take notice of what's going on. And to act like they are before the judge of all the earth, the great I am. Think about what was said to Moses when he approached the burning bush. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the ground whereupon thou standest is holy ground. We live in an age that's quite profane. Things that are spiritual, we have them lightly. But we shouldn't. We shouldn't all. When it comes to singing, we should be putting forth our best effort to sing praises to God in these psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. From the selection of the songs to making sure they are in harmony with the Bible when we teach them and our participation in them. Some of us just, I'm afraid, just sort of look cross-eyed and grunt when it comes to singing. It's not right. It's not putting your best foot forward. It's not doing all you can do when it comes to God's will. And then think about how much Christ put into saving us. So when it comes to singing, we sing. And we're not going to do anything else we're faithful to God. And you may find churches of Christ above the door on the marquee, and you may go in there, and they may be doing something else. That just says they're in error, and they've left the truth. Everybody should be singing together decently and in order. That implies a song director. That's his, his authority to exist, is to keep us all work, worshiping decently and in order. That's true of anything. It's the way the worship period is to be carried out. We see in 1 Corinthians 14, 15 that we're to sing with the understanding. Now, much of that's said in the days of miraculous gifts and the regulation of them, but the principle is the same. 
We ought to be participating in these songs where we can understand what we're saying. We ought to study the song. Do you ever pick up your songbook and just study it? We ought to. People can teach lies in singing just like they can teach lies in the pulpit or in the classroom. We ought to think about it. We ought to understand something about the nature of these songs and be careful with them. So vocal activity is demanded, Ephesians 5.19. The heart must be in it. When I say the heart, I speak of the intellectual powers, rational powers that are part of our inward man, for that's what the heart means. The spirit that is the real you that dwells in this body for a while. When it comes down to the conscience and the will and the emotions, all those ought to be involved in that. That's how we worship God spiritually. The understanding must be there. Our minds, therefore, must be upon the song. Now, always people haven't sung in four-part harmony. That wasn't even developed something like 300-something or 400-something, I forget now, long after the first century. Well, then why is it authorized? Because it's a form of singing. We're authorized to sing, and when we engage in it, then we're singing. We must understand that about singing itself. We're aware of the teaching of the Bible as to teaching that is to be done, the teaching of the Word of God, the preaching of the gospel. Anything that helps me do that more effectively is itself authorized. Thus, the PA system is authorized, though there never was a PA system like we have found in the New Testament. For that matter, not a building. You can't find in the New Testament where they ever own land to build a building on it. Well, then where's our authority for it? thought you people went by the pattern of the New Testament. Because to be able to assemble demands a place by implication. Try to assemble without a place. And you'll be a dunce. You have to have a place to assemble. As to the nature of that place depends upon the ability of the people assembling there as to the kind of place they're going to be in. They may have to be under a shade tree. They may have to rent a place. They may have to be in somebody's house. It may be that they can afford land and live under a government that allows them to do so and build a building that allows them to do what the Lord said the church ought to do in that building, although all the work the Lord wants the church to do is certainly not in that building. When they do that, of course, they're going to have to realize uh, it costs something to keep the building up. A lot of times we don't realize that. I've seen over the years people, oh, we want to get to where we're big enough to have a building. Well, when you have a building, you have to keep it up. Because that sets a very bad example in the community. If you look like you're meeting in a chicken shed, it says the people there don't care too much about things. Now, if that's the only place you had to meet and you're running from the law or something because it outlaws Christianity, doesn't want the church to assemble, you might be glad to be in a chicken shed or a barn or somewhere. That's not the case in America, is it? So we need to be mindful about those particular things, and the building and grounds must be up kept. Uh, it might surprise the church here, and it won't hurt you to hear about it, that we just spent about $28,000 in getting the air conditioning units put in. Well, you have to. Seems to me it's very expedient to have that in Houston in particular. What could go on in Houston without air conditioning? Ask yourself that. In any secular adventure, so we have that. I had to put a new roof on last January. That cost several thousand dollars. So if you're going to have a building, it takes up keep. It takes the members understanding that. You do, don't you? Understand that. And that's before you ever get around to what church is all about, spreading the gospel and saving souls. And you know, if a building or the land is not expediting the spreading of the gospel and the saving of souls, not much worth to it. Helping the church be what the church ought to be. So people have to think about those things. They rarely do because they get done, and traditionally they're done, and on and on we go, just like singing. That's just what we do. Somebody says, why do you do it? I don't know what's right we do. And then somebody comes along and says, well, let's add the mechanical instrument of music to it. Okay, sounds good to me. We never have done that. We'll do it. You see, they don't know anything about Bible authority. They lost sight of it. And that's where the church is in many places today and has been for a number of years. That's the reason they can introduce all sorts of things into the worship and other activities of the church. They're not keenly aware of the importance of doing only what the Lord authorizes and how the New Testament authorizes and how we ascertain that authority. 
they read scriptures and they really don't understand what they say. We need to understand that when it comes to our singing. Now, how do you find authority for any music other than singing in the worship of God? You don't. It's not there. So people try to go back and say, well, David did it and it was all right. Well, are you going to follow David for your example? He offered sacrifices and all this kind of thing. You won't use him for an example except for what you want to do that you like here in the first place. So we're not interested in what goes on, as I said in the beginning, under the law of Moses or anything else went on back there in the patriarchy. Why don't we then, if we want to use those for examples, just uh, have our worship centered around the family? That's what it was, a patriarchal age. After all, Abraham lived not under that. He didn't know anything of, the, of Judaism or the church. And he worshiped at an altar where he offered sacrifices. After all, don't you know better about your needs of the family than anybody else? So just have a family worship. Build you an altar in the backyard and see how well the uh, neighbors like it when you go slaughtering sheep and burning them in the backyard. I think that'd be an interesting situation. I guess that's the right way to describe it. <laughs> Brethren, I'm taking a thing that is taken so much for granted by members of the church and then others outside the church that they just see it and it's that way and they never seem to think. Well, those people are doing that because they believe the New Testament teaches they must do it. Now, as to proving it, that's what I'm trying to do right now. Some people will say, well, we use mechanics and music. I had a lady tell me, I went to school with, high school. I talked to her several years ago. She's dead now. We were visiting. We hadn't talked a long time. And we had visited, and she was talking about being member of a church and she says it allows me to use my talent talent and play the piano and I can use my talent for the Lord she never gave any thought about what does the New Testament teach because she's not oriented that way most people aren't they don't see in the New Testament authority and you must abide by what you're authorized to do and how the New Testament authorizes they just see it as telling about what they did and if you get down in where you can get a preacher among that group to talk to you, they'll say, what, I want to remain back there like they are. And they'll confuse songbooks with singing. They'll say, you use songbooks, don't you? But the songbook helps me do only, 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 only what God commanded me to do, authorized me to do. That's what you call an aid. An aid helps you do something. The something is that which is obligatory. When you use your songbook, it's helping you discharge your obligation in the worship to sing. That's the obligation. And to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. But if you're not oriented to thinking that way, then you're liable to do about anything or at least attempt it. So we're talking about walking by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, when it comes to worship and when it comes specifically to the music that we use you can't say a whole lot more than what I've said along that line people will bring up this that and the other but let me show you the principle before we close that doesn't change it's found way back in the patriarchal age and you already know it and that is the building of the ark that God commanded Noah to build Look back to Genesis 6 and you'll see it. Make me an art of whatever kind of wood you want to use. Make me an ark of gopher wood. I don't know what gopher wood was. Some people try to tell me it's some kind of cypress. They don't know much more about it than I do on that. And I don't know whether they're right or not. But no one knew what gopher wood was. And when God specified gopher wood, and that's the only wood he specifies out of which Noah is to build that ark. That's all that's authorized. Now, if he had said use gopher wood and balsa wood, that would have put two kinds of woods he could have used. It gets into the matter of specifics and generics. 
authorization will be specific or generic. If he had just said, make me an ark of wood, he would have left it up to Noah's discretion to choose the wood. He didn't leave it up to Noah's discretion. He told him, go for wood. And that limited it. If he had given five other woods, he could have used five other woods. But without that authorization for those four other woods, he was left only with gopher wood. He knew that. Then when you go through the whole dimensions and so forth, the ark, God specifies those things. That's the way authority works. It specifies. Or it's generic. An example, let's come to the New Testament. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's obligatory upon the church. Well, what about it? Go, he didn't say, go by walking into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. If it had, they would have been limited to that mode of travel, walking, and we define walking, and we go from there. He just said go. Well, they were limited in their days to walking, to riding donkey or camel, or cart pull by something like that, or ship. That's it. But those were options, weren't they? Sometimes it would be better in carrying the gospel, which is the obligation, to go by ship. Because it gets you from point A to point B faster than walking. Well, let's come on down then to this day and age. Look at all the ways that we can go. But the obligation doesn't change, does it? It's still the same gospel they preached in the first century. All these other ways, whether it's the internet, whether it's flying an airplane, on a ship, walking, riding a motorcycle, whatever it might be, a car, those are simply, simply options from which we choose as to where we are that helps us do at that time and place and situation. What? Discharge the obligation, which is the same. Preach the gospel. Of course, that demands I must know from the Bible what the gospel is. But I'm talking about knowing the difference in specifics and generics. When it comes to worship, we sing. Why? It's what God said. I remember one time hearing the preacher tell this, and I may have used it here before. It's long ago, you won't remember it anyway. <laughs> he said, had a fellow come in back in the days, and the, the church was less educated in a lot of things, but some things they knew. They were a bunch of farmers. This fellow came in and had not been exposed to the church. He looked around and he says, where's the piano? One of the old brethren said, we ain't got no Bible for it. Now what do you mean? There's nothing in the New Testament of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who has all authority and is the head of the church that teaches me in singing praises to God to use a mechanical instrument of music. We sing why it's such authorized. And I don't mind saying what they used to say years ago too. That's the way that is right and cannot be wrong. Why jeopardize your soul? Just do what you know he said. Remember the simplest definition of faith? Taking God at his word. And we'll do it. On and on you could go. Abraham, take thy son, thine only son, the son whom thou lovest, and offer him. Why was that right? God said so. Take him at his word. He said about to do it. God will take care of everything else. And so when it comes to worshiping God, we see it's a must. We must worship him. It's imperative. In spirit and in truth. In spirit, my mind set upon the one I worship him. Worship means acts of obeisance directed toward to show my devotion. From the New Testament, I don't know what those acts are. We're talking about one of them. Singing, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Same place I learned that God wants to be worshipped in music, in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, is the place I learned that I'm to sing those psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And if I can understand that Noah way back there in the starlight period of the patriarchal age knew the difference in generic authorization and specific authorization, so can I. Now, the common example I use in everyday life is the restrooms we have in this building. 
One's going to designate the female, and the other's going to designate the male. And since that's the only classifications among humankind, all the other characters existing today notwithstanding, then when a lady goes out of here and she's looking for a restroom, she's going to look for something that indicates the female, women, girls, whatever. And that says, this is for you. Well, why doesn't she, being the devoted Christian she is, to say, I'm going to go over here to the one that says male? Or why does the male says men or boys or gents or something like that, gentlemen, on the door to the men's restroom? Why do we put that there? Because it specifies the people to use that restroom. It's that simple. And with ladies, it specifies the people to use that restroom. Now, I've often said, if the men really want to understand the law of inclusion and exclusion, let them decide to go right through that door that says, ladies, they will understand the law of exclusion rather rapidly. And they will know they have violated the law of inclusion. Now, I use that because it is so, it's a bit humorous, but I use it because it's so obvious that's what we do. So when you come together to worship God and you want to engage in music and your desire is to please God more than anything else, then your mind's attuned to why you're here and who you're before, and so you engage in singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs from the heart in monitoring one another in those songs and teaching one another all directed to God and you receive strength from it and you're on God's side and you know you're right with God in that area of worship. And you can apply that to every other act of worship in assembly of worship. We close the lesson this morning and I hope you'll be able to take these principles we've used in this and apply it to everything else in the study of the Bible to determine what God requires of you to become a Christian and live the Christian life. To be a Christian, you must believe that Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. And as a child of God, if you're operating your life where it's not all under the authority of Christ, you need to repent of that because that can't be a faith because faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And you need to walk by faith. You need to repent of whatever was stopping you from doing it. Confess it to God and pray for forgiveness. Now we offer you this invitation. If you want to do that, to respond to it while we stand and while we sing.